are in our April Fool's series, as you well know, and if you're just joining us, uh, I'm a prankster. That's something that the Lord is working on me. So when Easter Sunday fell on April Fool's, I could not let it go. Um, But this is our next to last one. We've looked at how Satan wants to fool us with a lie. We've looked at how Peter and his denial, uh, we called him the denying fool. We looked at Thomas, the doubting fool. Uh, Next week, we're going to look at Caiaphas, the willing fool. But today, we're going to take a little bit more of a dark turn, if you will, because we're going to look at Judas, the backstabbing fool. Anybody ever had one of them in their life? See, Judas, what's so sad about the story is he let a small thing in his life grow into something big that would end up being his undoing. You ever been there in your life? Something small can get really big and out of hand if you don't deal with it. Um, Like for me, I don't like going to the dentist. I'm not petrified of it like my wife is, but I don't like it. Does anybody like going to the dentist? You guys must be dental technicians or something if you like going because that's just wrong. All right. Um, So my senior year of high school, I noticed that I had a small cavity that was developing on a back molar. It didn't hurt. It was all the way in the back. So who cares, right? So rather than going getting it fixed, I left it. Forgot about it. No big deal, right? Well, a few weeks before I was about to move to Austria, a year or two later, uh, I was at the orthodontist for a last checkup, making sure I was good to go, didn't need another retainer, all that good mess. And I remembered that cavity. And so I asked uh, the orthodontist, hey, would you just take a quick look, see if I need to do anything about it. I mean, I think I'm good, you know. And uh, his eyes got the widest I have ever seen (laughs) at a dentist office. And I was like, yeah, that's probably not good. He sent me straight away to a dentist. And uh, he's told me that that cavity was no longer a cavity. It was a cavern. And uh, long story short, over the next several days and thousands of dollars later, root canals, crowns, all that, I finally had the tooth fixed. Two weeks later, after I'd moved to Europe, the crown came off. And if you know me, I'm a cheapskate. Like, I want that warranty. I'm not going to pay to get this fixed. So I didn't get it fixed. Two more years before I did anything with that tooth again. Could have done something about it, but make a really long story short, um, I now have a wide gap back here because I no longer have a tooth there. It started off really small. If I would have dealt with it right there, guess what? I would have still had all my teeth, but I didn't. And at multiple opportunities, I could have dealt with it, but I chose not to. You ever have that in your life where something small comes about and you don't deal with it? And because you don't deal with it, it becomes something bigger. If you ever got a bill in the mail, right? Right? And you either don't have the money or you weren't happy about the bill and you ignored it. How many phone calls did it take from the debt collection agency to get your attention, right? Something that started small, it's amazing how fast interest and penalties rack up, isn't it? Or maybe this happened to you. You ever had that check engine light come on? And then before you know it, the check engine light is just simply another decoration on your dashboard. It's all good, right? And then maybe months later, maybe years later, you're looking at the mechanic bill and just killing yourself because I should have dealt with it then. Anybody ever been there? I mean, it can happen in just about anything, but it's not just with money. It's not just with things that need to be fixed. Sometimes it's with things in our heart, too. You ever had a relationship go bad, and it started with something small that you didn't deal with? Maybe a snide remark. Maybe that sarcastic joke that wasn't handled so well. Maybe there was an offense, but rather than dealing with it, it festered and festered, and before long, somebody who was a close friend was actually a distant enemy. You ever been there? Small things can become big things And big things can knock us out when we should have dealt with them when it's small. We're going to look at this concept when it comes to Judas this morning. You see, this story, in my opinion, is a tragedy. Because Judas went from a model disciple. Now, we 
hear the name Judas and we automatically think traitor, right? Anybody name their kid Judas? Before he betrayed Jesus, understand this. He was a model disciple. He wasn't like the movies. You would have never been able to pick him out. He didn't wear a black robe when everybody else wore a white robe. That's just fiction, all right? You would have never known what was going on in Judas's heart. So he went from the model disciple to the ultimate traitor in what seemed overnight. So let's look at the story of Judas today, because I think in this story, there's some things that we need to examine in our own heart and life, because I don't know about you, but I want to deal with stuff when it's small, and I don't want it to take me out later when it's big. Amen? Cool. Well, let's look at Judas this morning. You guys with me? Cool. So Judas, he was a normal average dude in Israel, right? In ancient Judea. And uh, so Judas was like many other young men at the time. Jesus had called him out to follow him. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but Jesus actually had a lot more than 12 disciples. Did anybody else know that? Now, he had all of these disciples, and one day, Jesus knew it was time to designate 12 of them as apostles. So he went to pray about it, to see which ones of these are going to be my 12, his inner circle, those who he poured into the most. Luke records when this happens in chapter 6, verses 13 and 16. It says, when the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. The last two names, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, I fully believe Jesus foreknew all of this, that he knew that Judas was going to betray him because he was fully man, but also fully God. Now, Judas, just like the other 12, It's important that you understand that he literally walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He was literally walking and talking with the creator of the world in God's very presence right there. Every miracle that Jesus did, Judas was a eyewitness of it. He knew fully that Jesus held all the authority and the power of God in his hands. Judas walked and talked with Jesus. And not only that, he didn't just see the miracles. Judas had a deep understanding of the miracles. In Jesus' time with his disciples, he would not just teach them a little bit, but he would help them to understand the depth of who God was and the the mysteries of the heavens and the earth. Um, The disciples even were confused at points of why does Jesus have to make this so plain to everybody else? I mean, we get this, right? In Matthew 13, 11, we see a little glimpse of the stark difference of how deep the disciples understood God and versus the other people because of what Jesus had, had said. In, in Matthew 13, 11, he records the disciples came to him, to Jesus, and asked, why do you speak to, to the people in parables? In other words, analogies, stories to help people understand. He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. You see, Judas, just like all of these disciples, knew the secrets of the kingdom of heaven because Jesus invested in Judas just like he did all the other 12. He had a deep understanding of Jesus, had a deep relationship with Jesus. But there was one thing that separated Judas from the rest. One thing, he allowed greed and pride to remain in his heart. When Jesus called all of his disciples, when he called all of us to follow him, Jesus said to lay down our own way, lay down everything that we have and pick up the cross and follow him. All the other disciples, they dealt with everything in their life. They dealt with their sin, they dealt with their pride, their greed, their arrogance, everything. They dealt with it. They put it in the hands of Jesus. And they were becoming more and more like Jesus. But Judas, he held on to some greed. He held on to some pride. But nobody even knew. No one but Jesus knew what was actually going on in Judas's heart. He was a model disciple. Judas was, was more 
than just somebody who had something messed up in their heart. Judas let that small issue, a little bit of greed here, a little bit of pride there, he let it morph to where he developed into a full-blown hypocrite, an actor, someone who projected something they weren't. We see this very clearly for the first time when the Apostle John points it out in his gospel. The setting is Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. A few nights later, Mary and Martha, his sisters, hosted this banquet in Jesus' honor. The next day, he would be going into Jerusalem, and that started the events of the crucifixion. So he's right outside this of Jerusalem at this point. They're at dinner, and then Mary comes in with a pint of lard. That was a very expensive perfume at that time. She takes the perfume, pours it on Jesus' feet, and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. Now, to us, that sounds a little whack, right? I mean, ladies, are you going to go to your husband or some other dude that you like, Brad Pitt or whoever the guy is nowadays, and like spray his feet, pour that whole bottle down and start wiping his feet? Anybody? No. Okay. But back then, what she did was a beautiful act of worship because she understood that Jesus was God, that he was the Messiah, that he was the hope of the world. And she was lavishing her praise onto Jesus. She was glorifying him. And here is what Judas did. This is what he said. John records this in chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. For the first time, we, the third party reading, see what's going on in Judas's heart and life. You see that greed, that pride, that arrogance that Judas had held on to morphed into full-blown hypocrisy. When he said it should have been sold and given it to the poor, there's two things going on right there. He's saying, number one, look at me how generous I am. Look at me how much I want to help everybody. But we know the motive of his heart. The motive of his heart was so that he could gain from this. The second thing, and this is sinister, was that he was offended that somebody would spend their treasure to worship Jesus. He was offended that someone would take what they have and lavish it on Jesus. Judas, who was a model disciple, was a pure and an unadulterated hypocrite, a full-blown actor. What was in his heart was evil, but he masqueraded as a child of light in front of everybody. Judas was so offended at this that he wasn't getting what he wanted to get. It was right after this. John records that it was right after this moment that he went to the Pharisees and to the, to the chief priests to sell out Jesus. Matthew puts it like this. He says, the one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver or about one week's wages. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Out of his arrogance, out of his pride, he went behind Jesus' back, behind all the disciples' back, and went to Jesus' enemies and betrayed him for nothing more than a week's wages. How do you go from being a model disciple to a backstabbing fool? It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in an instant. It happened with something small that he didn't lay at the feet of Jesus, that he didn't lay down when he started following Jesus. The story isn't over there. As you know, shortly after that, they went into the Last Supper. Judas was there with all of them, and Jesus says, one of you guys is going to betray me tonight. And all the disciples were just heartbroken at that. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? No, it couldn't be me. It's not me. And even Judas, surely not I, after he'd already done part of the betrayal. A complete 
evil hypocrite at this point. As Jesus sent him out, said, do your worst, go do your bidding. None of the other disciples even picked it up at that point. Because I have a feeling that if they would have even picked up, had the slightest hint of who the traitor was, that guy wasn't getting out of there alive. All right? I mean, I would have taken him out too. So Jesus and the 11 go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and here's what happens next. Matthew 26, 47 through 50. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a, a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Betrayed with a kiss. This isn't just a saying in our culture. It comes right back to here. You see, in that culture, a kiss of that nature, a kiss on the cheek, was meant or reserved for the closest of friends. It was somebody who had a close relationship would greet with a kiss. Not just anybody, but someone who you deeply cared about, were deeply loyal to and deeply loved. And Judas chooses that sign as the way he would betray Jesus. How do you fall that far? How do you go that far from being a model disciple, one of the 12, to be willing to betray the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, with a sign of deep friendship? It didn't happen overnight. Matthew goes on in, verse, or in chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. After Jesus had been beaten, interrogated, and condemned to die, here's what we find out about the end of Judas. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. What a tragic, tragic story of someone who comes from so high, such a noble position, to fall so far to end up taking their own life at the end of a noose. What is it that would cause somebody to do this? But notice something. He felt remorse in this moment, but he never made it right. He never made it right. I mean, if you get a speeding ticket, chances are, as soon as the cops had a visual range, you're doing it again, right? We feel remorse because we get caught. We feel remorse because we didn't, we know we did something wrong, but remorse is worthless unless it morphs into repentance, Repentance is when we change our behavior. We correct what was wrong. Judas never did that. He was overcome with remorse, but never changed his behavior, never dealt with what was in his heart. He went from being the pr in the presence of God for three years, walking and talking with Jesus, to choosing eternal separation from God. Let that sink in for a moment. How do you fall that far? Again, it doesn't happen overnight. So as we examine the story of Judas, what does that mean in your life? What are, what are the things that we need to understand from this? What are the things that we need to check our own hearts for to make sure that we don't end up like Judas? The first thing is, don't be fooled because you can be close to God's presence but not changed by his power. Let me say that again. You can be close to God's presence, but not changed by his power. I mean, you can experience his grace. You can experience miracles in your life. You can experience his goodness, but you can refuse to allow his power to change your heart, to change your life. Judas, as we already talked about, he lived alongside of Jesus. He served alongside of Jesus. He saw miracles. He proclaimed the gospel. Judas was anointed. Scripture says that Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. 
to go proclaim the good news, to go perform miracles, to cast out demons in his name. Judas was one of the 12. He saw people get healed. He cast demons outside of people. Judas was anointed. He lived close to the presence of God, in the presence of God, but he refused to allow the power of God to change him. Maybe you've been going to church your whole life. Maybe you've seen all the goodness of God. Maybe you've experienced the fun it is to go to church. Maybe you've experienced the power of community in church, and, and you just love the relationships, the network that you've built. Maybe you've seen prayers get answered supernaturally. But hear me on this. You can experience all the goodness of God you want, but unless you allow his power to change you, you've not dealt with anything. Judas knew the word. Literally and figuratively, the Bible says that Jesus was the word. He knew the words coming out of Jesus' mouth. He knew the word, literally and figuratively. But he did not allow the word to change him. Some of you guys know the Bible better than me. But if you don't allow the word to change you, you're in danger just like Judas was right then. But it's funny, as we start walking with Jesus more and the Holy Spirit starts to bring up stuff in our life, isn't it funny how we want to hold on to some of our stuff? Kind of like a baby with a dirty diaper. It's warm, it's soft, and it's mine, all right? <laughs> that's TM Dave Ramsey. Uh, but that's kind of like it is in our life, right? We like our selfishness sometimes, don't we? We don't want to give it up. You mean, God, you bless me and I have to share? No. Or... Maybe you've got bitterness towards somebody, and that's your way of thinking you're getting revenge. You don't understand, Pastor Chuck, what they did to me. You don't understand what they said about me. I'm holding this on, on to it for me. This is my revenge, how I feel about them. And the Holy Spirit starts saying, deal with it. Deal with it. It's becoming something worse in your life. It's not just anger anymore. It's morphing. It's growing, and we just want to hold on. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's lust. Oh, well, that text message I sent, that's just harmless. Oh, that little conversation I had at work, I mean, that's just a little workplace flirtation. It's not going to grow into anything. Oh, yeah, sorry. It starts small. We can know the right thing to do, but not do the right thing. Small things become big things. We can be near the presence of God, but refuse to allow his power to change us. Don't be fooled like Judas. Don't be fooled like he was. You can be near the presence of God. You can be close to the presence of God. You can experience the presence of God, but you have to choose to allow his power to change you. You've got to open up your heart and allow his power and his presence to transform you. Secondly, don't be fooled. Sin left to fester blinds us to God's love. Let me say that again. Sin left to fester blinds us to God's love. In other words, when we allow sin to stay in our heart and we ignore it, we refuse to work on it, we refuse to trust Jesus with it, it will slowly and slowly start to shut the light of God out of our hearts and out of our life. Judas knew better than anybody how much Jesus loved him. He knew better than anybody how much the love of God was real. But he didn't respond to the love because he allowed his heart to harden to it. His pride and his greed went on for years. It wasn't just a momentary lapse. He allowed it to go on for years. You know what? Every one of us has sinned, right? I don't know about you, but I've made a lot of mistakes. I've sinned a lot. I've done some bad things. Here's where Judas took the bait. He said, this small thing is not a real thing. He said, this small thing can't destroy me. This small thing doesn't matter. You see, we can have issues in our lives. We can have struggles. We can have addiction. But the moment we choose to justify those things, the moment we start making excuses for those things, the moment we decide I don't have to do anything about that thing, watch out. 
over time, that will harden your heart harder and harder and close you off to the love of God. A great example of, of this in a, in a movie is the creature of Gollum. Anybody ever seen Lord of the Rings? All right. This little creature took this ring as evil and powerful as it was. And rather than doing something about it before it completely took him, he lavished it, held it close, didn't, didn't want to do anything about it. It started to change his form. It started to change his behavior. Over time, it consumed him. That's what happens to us when we allow sin to go unchecked in our hearts. It starts to transform us. You see, the 11 disciples were becoming more and more like Jesus. Judas was becoming more and more like Satan. When we have sin in our life that we let stay there, we let our heart harden to the goodness of God. We can't have our soul singing if we don't have our heart open to what he's doing. So don't be fooled. They didn't think I saw that out of the corner of my eye, I did that. Don't be fooled. You can be close to the presence of God, but you can refuse to let his power transform you and change you. Don't be fooled. Sin left unchecked, sin left to fester, it'll blind you to God's love. And lastly, and most importantly, don't be fooled. It's never too late. If there's anything that's more tragic about this story than not, it was the fact that Judas never made things right. I want you to understand something. The day that Jesus called Judas, before he was even named an apostle, Judas had the opportunity to get it all out in the open. He had the opportunity to get it right with God right then and there. When Jesus called him to be an apostle, same thing. Jesus, thank you for this, but I need to let you know about something. I'm struggling in this area of my life. I need your help to help me overcome this. But he didn't do it. Every time he stole out of the money bags. Let me tell you, Judas knew. He knew what he was doing was wrong. Every time he felt the Holy Spirit say, that's wrong. You need to deal with that. You shouldn't be taking this money. Every time was an opportunity for him to come forward, confess. Judas knew that Jesus' arms were wide open. He saw Jesus take the most hated people in culture, the people whose lives were most filled with sin and welcome them with arms wide open. Do you realize that? He saw the grace and love of God at every turn. He knew if he could just confess, if he could just let Jesus in with the struggle in his own heart, Jesus would have opened him with his same arms wide open and forgiven him and restored him. But he didn't do it. Right up to the moment when he went to the chief priest, and sold out Jesus. He could have come back to the Last Supper and confessed right there, Jesus, I just made a terrible mistake. I've gone too far. I've gone too far. I just sold you out. Arms wide open. Jesus would have been there. Arms wide open. When he came with the, with the temple guards, do you realize that he could have fell at the feet of Jesus right there? He knew what he was doing was wrong. But he let his sin consume him. He could have fallen at the feet and been forgiven and restored. Even after, even after the guards took him away, even after Jesus was nailed to the cross, Judas could have went and kneeled at the foot of the cross and said, Jesus, I did this to you. I am so sorry. I have sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I've allowed this thing to do something more terrible and evil than I could ever imagine. But he didn't. Now, something really interesting. If you compare Peter and Judas, many people consider the same thing a close or equal betrayal. You see, Peter publicly denied Jesus, publicly betray betrayed Jesus. Judas went behind his back and betrayed him. Both a very painful and real betrayal. The difference was it drove Peter to repentance. It drove Judas to eternal separation. They both felt great remorse. It says Peter wept bitterly, bitterly. Judas was so remorseful that he hung himself 
One, choose to let their remorse leverage into repentance and restoration. The other, let it leverage into eternal separation with God. How tragic is that? That at every step of the way, Judas could have chose freedom. He could have chose hope. He could have chose forgiveness and come into the arms wide open of the Savior, but he didn't. Remorse is only remorse unless it drives us to repentance. Let me tell you, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what's inside of your heart, but I know how some things can get lodged into my heart. Don't let those things drive you to the place of no return. Don't let those things drive you to a place where you start shutting down the love of God in your life. It's not too late. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've been. It doesn't matter what you're thinking right now. It's not too late for you. Jesus, just like he showed his whole life here on earth, his arms are still wide open and he wants you to come home. He wants you to help. He wants to cleanse your heart. He wants to purify you. He's there. He's not ashamed of you. He is not ashamed of you. He wants your heart and he wants you to come home this morning. Whatever it is that you may feel right now, the Holy Spirit is stirring in your heart. In a moment, I'm going to encourage you to let it go. Let it go. It's time to put it in his hands. You see, you have two choices. You can be like Peter and allow the love of God to set you free, or you can be like Judas to let it enslave you for eternity. It's this simple, that I can be freed from my sin, or I can be enslaved by it. It's that simple. If there's nothing else you take away this morning, you can be freed from your sins, or you can choose to be enslaved by it. There's no middle road. There's no middle road. You can be free or you can be enslaved to it. Would you stand with me this morning? My heart is that every single one of you experiences the best of what God has for you. Let me be honest. This is a hard sermon for me to preach, all right? Because I know right now the Holy Spirit's bringing up stuff in your heart, and that's a hard thing, okay? I know how wretched my sin has been. I, I've seen the devastation in my life. Not, I'm not talking about just a tooth. I've seen devastation in my life when I let things go unchecked. I want you to experience the very best that God has for you. I want you to experience the fullness of the freedom that he has for you this morning. But we have to make a choice to choose freedom and not enslavement. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Maybe you've been holding on to unforgiveness, bitterness, it's time to let it go. Maybe you've been holding on to greed. Maybe you've been holding on to dishonesty. Maybe you've been holding on to fear. This morning, it's time to let it go. It's time to be free from the sins that want to entangle you. It's time to be free from those hidden things in your heart that want to take you out. In just a moment, we're going to pray together and we're going to open our hearts for the Holy Spirit to come in and free us from those things. But before we go there, I want to talk specifically to you that, that are here this morning that's never started a relationship with Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're not currently in a relationship with Jesus, you've never invited him in your life, or maybe you did a while ago and you walked away, freedom starts when we come to him. This morning, I want to invite you to come home back into the open arms, the loving arms of Jesus. As you know, he came, he lived, he died, and he rose again so that you can be free, so that you can have a relationship with him. Again, I'm gonna say it again and over and over, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, his freedom is still here for you. If that's you and you're ready to come home, I'm not gonna make you do anything weird, but I just want you to raise your hand so we can pray together. If you're ready to come home this morning, right now, just lift your hand, amen. Amen, I see your hand, thank you, I see your hand. Amen, anyone else? You ready to come home this morning? Thank you, I see your hand, amen. Right now, if you're one of those that just raised your hand, I'm gonna pray this prayer, I thank you, I see your hand. Now, I want you to make this prayer your own prayer in your heart right now. Jesus, right now, I thank you. Lord, that I'm here in this moment, that you brought me here for this reason and this time. Right now, I, I acknowledge I need you. I invite you to come into my life. Father, forgive me 
of every sin that I've made. Forgive me of every mistake. I ask that you would enter my life, make me new, restore me, help me to experience the freedom that you bought on that cross for me. And help me to live this day forward to honor you and walk in this freedom that you've given me. So in the name of Jesus we pray. Can we welcome them into the family this morning? Amen. Welcome. Welcome. Now those of you here who are followers of Jesus already, here's what I want us to do. I want us to just lift our hands right now. As a sign of surrender, whatever it is that may be in your heart, whatever there that the Holy Spirit may be already poking at you. Maybe you have a little icky feeling right now because you know something there. That's not because the Holy Spirit's condemning you. It's because he wants you to grab hold of that freedom he has. Right now, I'm gonna pray and I want you just right now, whatever the Holy Spirit's putting on your heart, confess it to him and give it to him right now. Let's choose freedom together as a family. Jesus, right now, I thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your freedom. Lord, right now I ask that you would come. Holy Spirit, come. Would you just search our hearts right now? Father, the depths of our hearts, those hidden corners of our hearts, come in and search us right now. Would you point out anything in there that's not pleasing to you? God, anything there that's not holy, anything there that we're holding on to. Right now, God, I confess my sin to you. I confess I've held on to this issue but I don't want to be enslaved by it any longer. Lord, I choose to let your life shine into me. God, I choose not just to be in your presence, but to be changed by your power. Right now, I acknowledge this, and I ask that you would forgive me and liberate me and help me to walk in your freedom. It's in the name of Jesus we pray.